he's exactly the picture that people would go, oh no, men can't be abused. Mm. He was being beaten up by like physically beaten by not only his wife, but her children from a previous marriage who were like teenagers. Wow. Um, and he was telling me his stories over a period of time. And one day he got tears. It was actually the last time I was going to see him. And he got tears in his eyes and he said, you have to write the book. You know, in a way, the the uh, alienator is taking the kids hostage. Mentally, yes. Yes. And sometimes physically. And yeah. Physically as well, because often they they do not allow any physical contact with the other with the other parent. Hi, Ann Silvers. <laughs> And Hi. welcome to the Anti-Alienation Project. I'm really excited to speak with you today, especially about different topics that you've discussed in your book, The Abuse of Men by Women. And I would love to know what drives you to speak out about the abuse of men by women. Yeah, so there's kind of two answers to that question. One is longer, one is shorter. <laughs> so first of all, counseling is not my first career. It's my third career. So I was a medical lab technologist for about seven years in hospitals. I was in a stay-at-home mom. And during that mid-phase there, that stay-at-home mom phase, I realized I wanted to be a counselor when I went back into the paid workforce. Okay. So I went back to school, 11 years of part-time school. When I was working on my Bachelor of for Psychology, I did a minor in women's studies. So at that time... I had really gone into the counseling thing with the image of I'm going to I'm going to focus on women, especially women who were abused as children. So similar story to my own thinking you heal the mothers, you heal the next generation. That was my thought at the time. The last class that I took on women for my women's studies minor was a class on men. Wow. And I read a book. I don't want to talk about it. Okay. By Terrence Real. And so he talks about how the male training is damaging to guys and, and how it sets them up for depression and it's being missed. And, and so from that point, I realized, okay, when I become a counselor, I want to focus on helping men because everybody's helping women. I mean, that's, that's kind of the easy stuff. The harder stuff is help this population that is being not given enough resources feeling. So I had that mindset. And I didn't know what the hell that would manifest. Then when I was starting my private practice, I, I was looking for it to be male friendly. And even that step, most counselors aren't doing. Right. Within a year or so of my practice, a male friend was telling me his stories about being abused by his wife. And I was minimizing them in my mind initially until I realized, oh no, this is this is really happening. And it opened my eyes to, no, it, the abuse is not just one-sided male to female. It can happen in the other direction. And so I started talking about this and men came out of the woodwork. And I realized I had nowhere to send them. All the resources are geared towards giving lip service to, yeah, okay, sometimes a guy might get abused by a woman, but it's not very often and it doesn't really hurt and it doesn't really matter. I wrote the book to create the resource. Um, and then I heard more and more stories and, and learned. When you write a book, you learn a lot. <laughs> I can only imagine um, in your book, the way that you wrote it, it was so clear and straight to the point. And I loved that. I could just read the entire thing and not have to read paragraphs of, uh, you know, description or long stories that get kind of difficult. So it, it really is a resource that just it's what you need to know. So what were you hoping to accomplish by writing your book? What is hoping to accomplish is fill a void. So be able to give men who are abused and even abusive women a, a place to go to find information where they didn't have to sort through and change the genders on the examples. Because uh, men already have a hard time recognizing they're being abused mm. by a woman because the culture is saying, no, 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 this doesn't happen. It doesn't fit the, the male training that they should be able to solve all the problems that um 
they're they're the responsible party that kind of thing and so if you send an abused man to resources where he has to in his mind flip all the examples that are he's bad she's good he's just going to get reinforced that no 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 it must it must be me I, I must be wrong and I didn't want that I think it was Toni Morrison who said if there's a book that you want to read Mm -hmm. and it isn't written you need to write it I love that I love that <laughs> I'm an English major so I love Toni Morrison oh, I love to read okay. I, I bet it's been very validating for a lot of men out there to to have this resource have you heard from a lot of readers or have you heard feedback on oh yeah oh yes oh yes a, a lot of men so when I was even it took me three years I think to write that book um, and so as I was gathering stories and writing, I tell this little story of a man, um, and he was this big guy, professional. So, so from the outside, you would think this guy's got everything going for him. He's exactly the picture that people would go, oh no, men can't be abused. Mm. He was being beaten up by like physically beaten by not only his wife, but her children from a previous marriage who were like teenagers. Wow. And he was telling me his stories over a period of time. And one day he got tears. It was actually the last time I was going to see him. And he got tears in his eyes. And he said, you have to write the book. I've been think doing a lot of thinking about this too. Um, <clears throat> in my own case, my mom was the abuser, but she painted my dad to be the abuser. Mm -hmm. And she just always played the victim and she would um, often incite his anger or provoke him, often provoke him. And, but me as a little kid, like seven, eight year old kid, I just saw her crying and I didn't see him crying or feeling upset. I just saw him being angry. Mm -hmm. So have you um, noticed anything like that? Like women purposefully provoking the, the man? Yeah, you were describing so well when you used words like, they, an abusive person could provoke the other person or incite. Those are great words that you were using to describe what I see a lot. And for somebody who is in a relationship and they begin to recognize, oh, this, you know, this pushes me to places I don't like me in myself. This is, this is not me. Mm -hmm. That's a really big wake up call for somebody to really consider, can I stay? Because a lot of a lot of men will stay in abusive relationships to keep the kids safe, so they have to think through: Am I accomplishing that when she's just upping the ante all the time? Yeah. Um, I I had a guy, uh, very like high up Fortune five hundred kind of guy, professional, um, and his wife would badger him, like be yelling at him for half an hour mm -hmm. and if he then came back you know after a half an hour of being verbally beaten down mm -hmm. would yell something at her she'd record it oh my goodness this in is... your book you discuss the concept of parental alienation I don't think you actually used the term but or maybe mm -hmm. maybe you did but um I think I do but I'm not sure yeah, yeah. But how, I'm interested in um, hearing about how you first became aware of this abuse and what motivated you to explore it further. Talking to men about their stories, it just is there often, uh, mm -hmm. parental alienation. And I, it, it can happen in other in, in either direction. Like, so a, a, a father could alienate a mother. I, I think it happens more often in the direction of a mother alienates a father because it's easier to get away with. Mm. So for a lot of reasons, one is culturally, we're in a phase where we believe women and we don't believe men. Mm. Uh, family court is very much uh, in a phase where they believe women, they don't believe men. Alienation is a brutal, torturous position to be in as a, a, a parent who's being alienated. For sure. Um... I hear from parents every day who are targeted and they haven't seen the kids in years or decades. And I do get a little frustrated because mm -hmm. I like to keep the the light on the children and focus on the children in this situation. Mm -hmm. From my own experience, it's and talking to dozens of others, 
it seems as if all the similarities must come from somewhere. And in my mind, I wonder if it comes from the pathology, because it mm -hmm. seems like most of these parents have personality disorders. What are your thoughts on that, on all the specific patterns and similarities among not only the alienators, but the effects on the parents and the kids? I think in terms of why there's so many similarities in the in what the alienating parent does is partly pathologies and partly because it's out there in that this is what you can do to get control of your divorce, to get control of your children, to punish your ex, you know, whatever might be motivating somebody, it's out there and it's known. Parallel and, and overlapping uh, and yet different situation would be women getting pregnant on purpose, but presenting it as an accident. It's known that the man does not want to have a child at this time with that woman, uh, but she gets pregnant anyway manipulates the pregnancy and presents it as an accident as a way to trap a man or um, get uh, get child support, get a child, uh, you know, whatever her motivations are, they're malicious, right? But it's so common because it's kind of out there and women who would be, have this propensity they pick it up. That's so scary. Is that a form of sexual abuse, you would say? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes. I've been dying to ask someone who actually has all of the knowledge like you about the the parallel of Stockholm Syndrome in the alienated child. And since you are a licensed counselor and you know about all of these issues, mm -hmm. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Okay, so so yes, Stockholm syndrome does apply, and so to give people, give you and other people, the background. Stockholm syndrome is is named after an actual hostage taking event in Stockholm, where the hostages began to identify with the hostage takers, align themselves, have sympathy for the the hostage takers. You no, know, in a way, the the uh, alienator is taking the kids hostage mentally yes yes and sometimes physically and yeah. physically as well because often they they do not allow any physical contact with the other with the other parent and so and and what they do is they really work that part of brainwashing um the the child into identifying having empathy for only the alienating parent there's also an element of safety. It can feel safe to align yourself with this uh, person who is convincing you that that is your safety zone, is to be with them. And so that's an element also. And I don't know that that's so much part of Stockholm, but that is part of what's going on with the, the uh, alienated child. So, for, so to back up a little bit with the Stockholm example, when the people start to align with the abusers, am I am I correct in saying that that is a survival technique? I think with an alienated child, that's an element is okay. is a survival technique because uh, again, so that's their safety zone, and children are dependent on their parental units for mm -hmm. food and shelter and love. That makes sense to me. In your book, you state that, quote, when a woman who distorts the truth to get a restraining order against her partner to force him out of the home so she can punish, control, or demean him is abusing her partner and the system meant to protect people who actually need the protection. Can you talk a little bit about that? I've heard this might be called a silver bullet technique. The, the concept of silver bullet is that you have something so powerful it instantaneously kills. Oh, okay. There's a place where silver bullet fits really well for parental alienation, false accusations, mm -hmm. false accusations that create, that are part of the alienating pattern. Mm -hmm. So that would look like uh, a parent falsely accusing their, the other parent of abuse, uh, any kind of abuse of, of themselves or the child. And, and again, it has to be false. It's so powerful. These false accusations of abuse are now so powerful in our legal system that it is an instantaneous silver bullet. It's an instantaneous kill in yeah. terms of harming that the alienated partner's parents' ability to see the children. Right. Yeah. 
and have a relationship with the children. Where it falls apart sort of in the in uh, in the analogy with the silver bullet, the silver bullet actually goes back to the story of that's how you kill, kill a werewolf. The werewolf being a bad character. Oh. So this is not actually being used to kill a bad character. This is killing something good. I see. Um, you mentioned the court and the legal system. And from what I can tell, please correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. It seems as if if you make an accusation, false accusation, there is oftentimes a protective order because the judge wants to err on the side of safety. It seems as if in family court, you're, there's no presumption of innocence. Correct. Um, you don't need that evidence to get a protection order. And in that span of time, a parent can solidify the alienation and destroy the relationship with the parent and child. So do you have any thoughts on that or whether that is the only way to to handle these things? How, how can that be resolved so that protective orders are not encouraging alienation? Correct. I, I, I think you describe it well, that that is what's happening. Um... And it's part of a whole DV system that has been created around the narrative that domestic violence um, only happens in one direction, only happens male to female. So that is the way the DV community is organized, and it has influenced law and courts. Uh, it, it influenced culture. Um, and so, and it's a closed system. So it studies itself and mm -hmm. therefore creates this now, everything wants to be research-based, but they'll present this research that then is convincing to lawmakers and courts, et cetera, and the culture that perpetuates the myth that it's uh, domestic violence is because of patriarchy and it's only in one direction. So that's a system where we're up against. Courts have more discernment and look at cases uh, more more realistically. And it, it's challenging. I can imagine it would be challenge, challenging for a judge who actually has their eyes open to, yeah, I shouldn't believe every woman who comes forward with an accusation. But then like you say, they want to they have to err on the side of of safety. We need more of a recognition that there is safety concerns on the flip side. Oh, yes. There's safety concerns. All of a sudden, this man has been kicked out of his house and kept away from his children. So there's there's harm being done to those men and to the children. And there needs to be more recognition of that. Then we move into there's a lack of empathy for men and boys in general. What would you say are, are the factors that have caused that the the lack of empathy yeah i think it's so ingrained in in us culturally I'll give you an example here in washington state we have uh just completed our third year of trying to get a state commission on boys and men and it would take a look at how men and boys are suffering and struggling uh, in a very targeted, research-based way, and bring together people who are able to create, come up with solutions. So we know that 80% of suicides are male. The vast majority of all deaths of despair are male. Another piece that really fits with what we're talking about today is a, a man is four times more likely than a woman to suicide. A divorced dad is eight times more likely to suicide than a divorced mom. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And these DV groups would probably argue for the opposite. So what they what they then focus on is because they don't want to focus on the stats that show men are are struggling because that doesn't fit the narrative. Um, so they'll focus on women attempt more often. Oh. Than men. So let's say one woman attempts six times. Now she shows up in the stats six times oh. as, as an attempt. Um, also in attempts, are they as serious about ending their life as somebody who suicides? And, 
and other so but and it's a great example of how this lack of empathy for males i just saw it on cnn a couple of weeks ago where the new research is showing that suicides are going up and and we know that 80 percent of suicides are male but instead they focused on the the female statistic that they thought would be, I don't know, they thought was more important um, or that their audience would be more interested in. Are, are people turning a blind eye on purpose, do you think, or are they just ill-informed? I think in a lot of ways they're, they're not informed. They, so when we can get statistics like 80% of suicides are male in front of them, it does help. Again, we're trying to get people to open their eyes, but it's very hard. Um, there are books are written about the empathy gap uh, mm. for males compared to females. And I think it goes back to like culture, long, long term culture. Males are relatively disposable and we raise them to be warriors so we can send them off to protect us and, and you know, run into burning buildings and dive in front of bullets and um, go into coal mines and do all these things. And, and there's an element of that uh, to the empathy gap. Is part of it having to do with women being seen as more of a victim? Like women are naturally playing the victim or they're more victimized or they're just not able to care for themselves or protect themselves like men can? It's complicated, I think. There are strong female voices that are beating the we're victimized drum. Mm -hmm. and, and that is part of what's playing into where we're at with parental alienation. Have you come across any successful interventions or strategies that have helped mitigate the effects of parental alienation for families? I wish I had stronger, more positive <laughs> uh, information to give you. I think uh, some things that help is for people to recognize how hard it is. So the recognition, just like I think you've been through with your own experience of having the support of a therapist who helped you recognize, yeah, that you've been through something traumatic, um, probably is ongoing traumatic elements to it and helping you with that trauma. I help fathers fight the good fight to get to see their kids and then also recognize when they have to give up. Okay. It can't be an endless attempt. It's not going to win, you know, when you've tried so many things and it's hard to know when to give up. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly an alienated, alienated parent could continue to send um, birthday cards and, and things like that. But we don't know if they're actually going to get to the child. I know of a parent who left Christmas presents on the porch for his kids and they got rewrapped and presented as, as the mom's presents. Keep the connection there and have proof later. I did try. Uh, so that's part of it. You want to be able to, the, the alienated parent wants to be able to present, I did try, even if they have to give up at some point. And I then try to encourage them that there are many times that the child as an adult finds their way back to the alienated parent. You know, hold on for that hope because it does sometimes happen and it might happen in their case. I love that you said that. And that's kind of, I believe, what my dad did. Like he never walked away completely, but I think he, after a while, realized that he, to stay sane and mentally healthy, he had to focus on building a, a wonderful life for himself. And I'm glad he did that because now that I've come, we've been rebuilding our relationship and everything, he's able to be supportive and, you know, he's not caught in his own trauma and he's able to help me. So I really appreciate that. And I want to take the minute, the moment to uh, thank you for what you're doing because alienated uh, parents who hear your story they can find encouragement in it. So you may have thought mostly your work is around helping alienated adults who are survivors of alienation. Uh, I see also, uh, that's very important. And I see also that the work you're doing is important for alienated parents. Thank you. Your work as well. I really appreciate everything that you've done. Honestly, I just get a little frustrated because 
I don't, I can't think of another type of abuse where therapists, judges, doctors, all professionals will allow the child to remain with the abuser. And I've spoken with other therapists who work with alienated children and their families. And I've heard that, you know, they're not even allowed to say the term parental alienation to the parents or the child. They're not allowed to have that conversation. Severe parental alienation to me is severe abuse. Yes. Um, I... You're right. There is this huge anti-parental alienation uh, movement. It's not they're fighting against, we don't want to have parental alienation. They're fighting against the concept that it exists. I know. Yes. And it's very strong and strengthening. It's the same people who are controlling the narrative around domestic violence. They're actually being anti-feminist though, because mothers are alienated too. I wonder if you can help me understand something. So I am supportive of the father rights movement and father's rights. And I, mm -hmm. I frankly, I don't understand why people, anyone would be opposed to it. Can you help me understand that? Yes, I think that the father's rights movement is doing better than it, maybe had been doing. One thing that happens is understandably an alienated parent is in a lot of pain mm -hmm. and we do not train males to be able to deal with emotional pain well. And so we have a lot of fathers who are in a lot of pain and when they present their struggles, it has in the past, been presented in a way that is angry and again they're understandably angry it just doesn't help their cause okay and then we have the empathy gap for males people have a hard time empathizing with males I think I see this on both sides it almost I almost wonder if sometimes people are drawing so much from their personal experience if they're jaded by one man they hate all men, or if they're jaded by yep. one woman, they turn against all women. And I, I, they fail to understand that anyone can be an abuser. It doesn't matter what's between your legs. Like anyone can abuse. Yes, that, that's right. I, I do see that. There's too much identification uh, with their abuser and then generalization. Mm -hmm. uh, generalization is actually one of what's called a cognitive distortion. It's it's so common, it's got a name. And so there is this tendency to overgeneralize from uh, personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and ideally therapists and courts, et cetera, would be able to have a more expansive view. There's another thing called confirmation bias. Yes. Okay. So confirmation bias is a psychological premise that we take in and absorb what confirms what we already believe to be true and we slough off the rest yes so if somebody has decided men are bad then whenever they see a, a, a man doing something that could be labeled bad they're ha ah, men are bad <laughs> and when they see men do good they just miss it mm -hmm. it doesn't challenge their their bias and i think we have a, a tremendous lack of appreciation for all that men do for us culturally as and as a society yeah. yes I, it's speaking about confirmation bias this is something i've been meaning to make a video on because confirmation mm -hmm. bias is such a big part of parental alienation i mean i made one video with my husband because i was interested in showing the point of view of someone who comes into a family they're told the story about who the dad is in my case my husband was told by me by my mom uh, a, a character of who my dad is and then he would take even the smallest things that my dad would do wrong or do maybe not even wrong, but evidence um, that he was selfish or unloving. And that's how my husband was pretty much brought into the, the fold, the yeah. fake fabricated reality that I had no clue was fabricated. He described it as like, he, he had these like goggles on. Are there any things that could get through to that kid and help you know get break that confirmation bias seems like such um a cult mentality and a brainwashing that you it's really hard to to break through right it is brainwashing it speaks to how it starts to perpetuate itself 
So the alienating parent can create the big story up front, like, like what happened with you. And then that, that becomes the bias. Now, everything is easy to sell on, well, yeah, that fits in with the pattern. And then the child themselves starts to see because they have the confirmation bias. So they'll, they'll start to just plug it in themselves. They don't need the alienating parent anymore to be telling them, yeah, that's how you should see it. Right. That's how you do see it. But one thing I would say is any parent who has been given a restraining order has to honor the restraining order, even though it was based on false accusations, et cetera. It's still, you have to honor the, the restraining order. So if you want to, if you've been told you cannot have any by a court, you can't have any contact with your kids, then, then don't, you know, so maybe you buy them a Christmas card every year and you keep it because someday they might come around and you can show them. I, I thought about you every year. I just, here's the piece of paper. Here's the restraining order that said, I you know, keep all that too. Mm -hmm. I would encourage the alienating parent. There was a man that is a, a friend of mine who told me his story before I really understood parental alienation as well as, as now, or I'd heard as many stories. His mom had pushed his dad out. The dad was not abusive. She convinced the kids to lie. They lied in court. Did the kids know they were lying or did they believe the lies? Or you're not sure? I think that I'm pretty sure the kids knew that they were lying, but they still thought this was the right thing to do. Wow. Mom convinced them this was the right thing to do. He couldn't win. And so he moved out of state and, and started his, his life again. He kept paying child support. Part of mom's alienating story was your dad doesn't pay support. Mm -hmm. So this was in the days when we actually sent checks. What, what used to happen was when you wrote a check and the person cashed that check that went back to your bank. And so you got what was a canceled check. You, you, you got the copy back of your check that had been cashed. He kept those. Oh, the dad kept those. Good for him. So when the alienated child found his way back to dad, and I think it was actually him as an adult going to dad and to say how angry he was with dad. Dad pulled a shoebox out of the closet with the support checks that had been cashed. Yeah. So if, even if you're forced to not have contact, you know, keep something that is, if the child ever finds their way back, you can show them, I did think about you. I do care about you. It's such a painful place to be. Yeah. Cause when you learn the truth, you, you're like, uh, up is down left is right and you don't know what is true and you can't trust yourself to know what's true and I, I from my experience I just started to look after the first initial shock I just was like looking for evidence like a little detective and mm -hmm. you know I, I'm still looking for evidence that's a great suggestion because to have those letters or the the checks it's that's brilliant evidence that the child will need one day. Keep the court documents, keep paper copies and digital copies of the court documents uh, because those things sometimes do age out online. Okay. Um, and so to be able to show the child, yeah, I did go to court for you here, here, and here. Have you found that among these alienators, there are some that know exactly what they're doing and that they're harming the child and they do it anyway. And some are so pathological, they believe their own lies. Have you found any distinctions or different types? It's really hard for me to buy that they that they believe their own lies. So do they know that they harm the child? Some pathologies don't care. So when you get into the very, you know, the malignant narcissist, the sociopathic, they have no they have no care about anyone other than themselves. So they just don't, it's not on their radar that it's harming the child. And some others would be, they're so focused on wanting a less complicated life. So like if you push the other parent out, you don't have to co-parent. And so some people want that simplicity. Evidence in my own life that there was some type of guilt, maybe like um, the, the telling me again and again over a period of 20 years, I hope you're not mad at me one day for your relationship for your dad. I hope you don't blame me for your relationship with your dad one day. And I would assure her, no, mom, it's all my decision. It's all my beliefs. Mm -hmm. That way, I think she, the alienation was able to hide in plain sight because my dad, at one point when I was young, did question. I don't remember exactly what he said. He never knew the term parental alienation until I told him about it. 
but he knew all along that my mom had done this and mm. she was behind this. This is one thing that I would love to talk about for a minute or two. I believe that it's the child's right to have access to both parents. Mm. I, I don't understand why some women and women's groups want to deny the child's right to have access to both parents. Can you offer some insight? Well, I think we are in a very anti-male phase culturally. And there is a lack of appreciation for what fathers bring to the table when it comes to being important in the life of children. So, so there's there's just a lot out there that is just so anti-male, anti-father that's pushing some of this uh, agenda. I, I just can't understand why why so many people would believe that children only need one parent and that's not going to harm them. You're right. It's hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, your book challenges traditional narratives, and I love that. Um, <laughs> I'm that type of person. I love challenging the status quo. How have you navigated any potential backlash or criticism for challenging the established views on what abuse usually looks like and the gendered-based abuse? Have you gotten any criticism? Oh, yes. <laughs> So I knew I would, I, you know, I knew when, when I was writing the book that uh, there was going to be people who didn't like that I was talking about this. I find even like speaking to a group of counselors, I'll have the majority of them nodding their head like, yeah, we need to be talking about this. But invariably, I've got somebody really mad at me uh, or a couple people out of a group and they want to fight back on it. And there's a number of reasons why that happens. Um it, it goes against narratives we have for gender roles, women being vulnerable, men being responsible, um, and a black and white way that we tend to look at things. It's called dichotomous thinking, di meaning two. We tend to see only polar opposites. It's also called polarized thinking. And so there's a tendency to think, well, we can either be on the side of men or we can be on the side of women, and we can't be both. And so that's another factor that plays into where we're at. We've got the pendulum swing thing where there certainly was a time in my lifetime when uh, women were not believed, domestic violence was minimized, people looked the other way when women were being abused. And then we started to res uh, respect that we need to deal with this and it's harmful and we should not look the other way but the pendulum swung too, way too far early on the whole dv thing got captured by people who uh only saw one view of it because they were only working with one view of it and so then that actually captured the whole system moving forward i don't know why we got to do this over and over again i know everybody knows the pendulum swings too far so why aren't they look on the lookout for it the, there is a growing awareness and then there's a growing um, understanding that a DV can happen in both directions and, and it can happen in same gender uh, relationships. Um, so can any gender configuration, it can happen. And the Johnny Depp trial made a huge difference. So, so many more people are aware it, we touched on earlier how people can overgeneralize their own experience. So if they were abused by a man, they, they see men as abusers. Um, and so the Johnny Depp trial, I watched it on Twitter in real Me time. <laughs> people switch. And so a lot of women who were abused um, by male partners previously, they had their aha moment of, oh, okay, so this abuse thing is bad. And it doesn't matter who's doing it to who it's right. bad. And, right. Um, so that makes me hopeful that maybe some people inside the system can, can start to uh, make some change. I'm just thinking back a little bit to the suicide statistic about men. I'm wondering if you think part of that has to do with men being less likely to reach out for support or and or men being less likely to validate their own experiences and realize like I need therapy, I need to get out. I or it seems like too with the parental alienation fighting infighting online between the men and the women. It's, I wonder if more women are just 
more likely to speak out about all of this. Because oftentimes the women that are speaking out about it, some are targeted moms and some are stepmoms whose who husband yes. is being alienated. Yes, yeah, yes. Um, right, so male training is um, don't feel pain. Yeah. Don't, certainly don't, don't express pain because you're not supposed to feel it. Um, don't have fear. Don't, don't uh, talk about your struggles fix everything, uh, you know, fix the toilet, fix the car, fix the problems. And, and so it's really hard for a guy to step forward and say, um, I'm in pain. I can't fix the situation. Uh, I need help. That's another thing. They're not supposed to ask for help. Um, and so we, we've, we've stifled their voices. When I get a clearer and clearer recognition of is we lament saying men can't reach out for help. We are all part of a system that has stifled that in them. And so we are all we all have to work at at um, changing that um, and changing the expectations we have for males. And um, I do think that that lack of emotional, that, that actual active stifling of emotions. It's part of the reason why I wrote my most recent book that you and I have talked about a little bit. So it's it's an emotional intelligence workbook. So that book is called Building Skills to Uplevel Life. I resonated with much of what you had written. And I think a lot of people who alienate their children do so for not only to, not only to hurt the ex partner, but to isolate the child. I can tell you, from from my own experience and speaking to dozens of other people who've been through this as children, they were through more more than one form of abuse. I I think that's something that people miss a lot of the time. They just think that they're, you know, using the ch child as a weapon, and they are, but they might also be isolating the child so they can get away with more abuse. Right. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. It's just something it's that almost like an ownership kind of aspect to it. They're they're capturing their child for their own and yeah. aren't really, it's certainly not the best interest of the child that they have in mind. No, it's like the worst interest of the child. Yeah. yeah. I just think it's so wrong to create this manufactured pain in your child and it has always been it was always the biggest pain I had throughout my whole life yes. that my dad didn't love me yeah that's a good term it's manufactured pain in in the child and part of the shtick is creating guilt it, it's, it's very guilt-based um in in the child like you you have you're letting me down that's the alienating parent saying, you know, if if you don't love me enough, you're letting me down. If you say anything nice about your dad, you're letting me down. You're causing me pain. How how heartless of you, the word heart, how heartless of you to not um, care more about me. And then when you learn the truth, it's like, wait, did I get this all backwards? And then you have to deal with, oh my gosh. So so now I have the DNA of this person who did all of this to me it's really I would not wish this on my worst enemy yeah um and that's something that I think really needs to be explored more really need to have more research done on the effects on the child long term mm -hmm. um, but enough about me and my story I would like to know from you what can we do to impact change well, I wish I had better news about about that we're not going to be able to affect change fast step one is do your healing um and um it doesn't mean that you get to a complete place of healing before you're you're an advocate um it's, it's just you know get past that raw raw part mm. um and i you know kudos to you for what you're doing i think it's so important is to bring people together um, for support. And this is how movements grow. They start small and they get bigger and bigger. And that's where we are. We're in the small phase. The bigger thing is we're trying to, uh, get people's awareness yeah. changed and we're up against some big cultural things, the mm -hmm. lack of empathy for males, um, this attachment that's happened with the DV community with its full force. And it's got a lot of power. 
Well, I hope that the social movement grows. I would like parental alienation to be a household term that more that most people know. And if you see or hear or watch somebody who's doing alienating behaviors, that mean you you can shame them and you can educate them on why it's so harmful. I mean, it really is severe abuse, even though you don't have you don't see the bruise or you don't see the blood. I think it's really important that the adult survivors of parental alienation, your voices are more likely to be heard than fathers. Because again, we have this empathy gap for males. Mm -hmm. And so the children, hard for people to not listen to the child's voice. And now you as adults are giving voice to the child version of you, your child self, and you're giving voice to the alienated children. And I really think as, as, the alienated children organize like you are and get your voices out there, you have a really good chance of breaking through. I hope so. That's kind of what I've thought since the beginning, because in court it's he said or she said, but when we speak up, we don't have a stake in the game. So, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get our voice, amplify our voices. It's just, it's a matter of getting, getting people to listen. Early on with the parental alienation, one of the things that happened was when it was first being written about and talked about in professional circles, there was talk of a parental alienation syndrome. Yeah. So then what people latched onto was, oh, the syndrome idea. We can't call it an actual syndrome. So then they threw the whole thing out with this fight over syndrome. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a syndrome, uh, but does that there is parental alienation. It's a real thing. It's happening and it's causing a set of symptoms in the children. So that's a little bit of what my audience can do. I would love to hear about what you're doing. What are you working on now? How can people stay in touch with you and follow your work? Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so I have my website and silvers.com. No E on Anne. And uh, so I, I blog on there. I've got a I've got a blog post about parental alienation. Uh, so if they go there and put, oh, maybe you'll put the link in the. In I'll put the link. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Makes it easier for them. I should mention I'm on Twitter as well, uh, but Twitter's having its. I don't know. It's day may have passed, I, but I'm still there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne, for your time today and your work that you do every day. I am so grateful for you, your determination and your brilliant books. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me.